It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dar uh, Carl Carell as today's speaker as part of the fifth annual Women in Science and Health uh, Care Symposium. Dr. Carell trained as an x-ray crystallographer and received his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Michigan, where he studied with um, the National Academy member, Dr. Martha Ludwig, to investigate the molecular basis of an electron transport protein. After graduating, he was an American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellow at Yale University with the Nobel laureate, Dr. Thomas Seitz. In 1998, he began his faculty career at the University of Chicago, and since 2004, he has been an associate professor in biochemistry and molecular biology at the Chicago Medical School. He has published 25 peer-reviewed manuscripts, several reviews and, a, and book chapters, and co-edited a book entitled Protein Nucleic Acid Interactions. Dr. Correll joined the Master Teacher Guild in 2017, and in 2019, he became a faculty member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Correll. Thank you, Bruce, for that kind introduction. And I would also like to thank Dr. Elliott for this lovely cup, which I will use regularly to remind me of Dr. Franklin's accomplishments. So this talk is also uh, sponsored by the uh, Master Teacher Guild. So Rosalind Franklin fundamentally increased knowledge about carbon compounds, DNA, and viruses. And these accomplishments were even more extraordinary because of her short life. She tragically died of ovarian cancer at age 37 and because of her intersectionality. She was unmarried, Jewish, and working as a physical chemist in a sea of men. Today, um, I will be talking about her contributions to DNA and tobacco mosaic virus. So we will uh, begin with uh, her uh, joining uh, King's College in January of 1951. So she entered King's College with 14 publications to her name, all of which dealt with the fundamental nature of carbon compounds, and she aimed to make discoveries in biology. So she was switching fields. Her new boss had assigned her to work on DNA, but he failed to inform uh, Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Wilkins' student, uh, Raymond Gosling, that they were to give up their work or hand it over to Rosalind Franklin and uh, Raymond was to now work under Dr. Franklin. Um, to make matters worse, Dr. Wilkins found all of this out after Rosalind Franklin had arrived upon his return from a holiday trip. So you might imagine that this uh, led to an icy relationship and you would be correct. This icy relationship lasted during her entire tenure at King's College. This particular presentation has two learning objectives. One will be focusing on her contributions to DNA and the second on her contributions to tobacco mosaic virus hereafter referred to as TMV. So, First, we have to set the background for what we knew about DNA prior to Rosalind Franklin's contributions. So we knew that DNA was the transforming uh, material uh, from the transforming principle, and uh, it was expected to be the genetic material, and this was from the pioneering work of Avery and colleagues. Um, DNA fibers could be obtained, but they were heterogeneous. Um, they could be obtained as long uh, fibers, approximately 2,000 nucleotides in length, with the following dimensions. And Shargoff uh, had determined uh, the ratios of the bases. So it was determined um, back in uh, 1949 that when you uh, did uh, analysis of DNA, that the concentration of A always approximately equaled the concentration of T, and the concentration of G approximately equaled the concentration of C. Some very interesting uh, birefringence data had demonstrated that the planes of the base rings were perpendicular to the axis of the fiber. 
And the other thing that sets the stage is um, just as Rosalind Franklin was entering Kings, um, Linus Pauling uh, made all the scientific community um, a buzz with his discovery that proteins fold into alpha helices. So helices were on everyone's mind. So before I go into uh, more detail about Rosalind Franklin's accomplishments, I just wanted to give a quick primer on why x-rays are needed. So if you want to visualize an object, you need to use a wavelength that is equal to or smaller uh, than the object you're trying to visualize. So if you're trying to visualize a red blood cell or a bacterium, uh, visible light is perfectly acceptable. However, if you're trying to visualize smaller molecules like ribosomes, tRNA, glucose, or a carbon-carbon bond, you need to use much smaller wavelength uh, radiation uh, in the x-ray realm. So when you visualize objects, for example, this cluster of balloons, the light diffracts off this object and the lens of the eye is able to refocus that. When you actually um, uh, employ x-rays on either a crystal or a fiber, you get diffracted light, but unfortunately the um, uh, the, the strength of this beam is so intense that you cannot refocus. So there's no lens powerful enough to refocus this image. And so you're left with this diffraction image and the critical component to, re, uh, to reconstruct the um, atomic structure from this is uh, missing in the data collection process. So this is referred to as the phase problem. And in 1951, we had another uh, uh, stumbling block, which is the, the, the solution to the phase problem was not yet available. So what were some important questions to answer about DNA? So one question is, um, what's on the inside of the fiber? Are the phosphate groups or the bases on the inside? How many strands are in the fiber? One, two, three, um, or et cetera. If there are more than one, uh, what, is the what are the directions of one strand with respect to the other? And if this particular fiber is helical, what are the parameters that define that helix? So these are some early uh, fiber diffractions of uh, DNA that were taken before Rosalind Franklin started. And one of the things that um, Rosalind Franklin did is from her co work, she uh, acknowledged how important it was to use the latest and greatest piece of equipment. So before she actually arrived, she made sure that she had a piece of equipment which could very narrowly collimate the beam and have the maximum intensity. She then started playing with samples. And what she realized is, is that the humidity of the sample was absolutely critical to getting a photograph. So anything below 75% relative to humidity, you would have a short fiber and that fiber would produce uh, this stunning photograph. So you can see that the diffraction pattern is infinitely more detailed than the diffraction patterns before Rosalind's uh, magic touch. And so she referred to this particular uh, um, uh, short fibers as a form or crystalline. If she then migrated the humidity, so she increased the humidity, and this is of the same exact fiber, to above 75%, the fiber would actually lengthen by about 25%, and she would get diffractions like this. And this is the famous photo 51 uh, uh, diffraction image, which we'll be talking about uh, much more during uh, in the next few slides. So the first breakthrough that Rosalind Franklin made was that A form and B form were interchangeable. So you could actually start with a fiber that's this form, and by um, increasing the humidity, you could actually get it to be this form. And then you could go back and have it go back to A form. So it was readily reversible. And this reversibility led to a fundamentally important conclusion of Dr. Franklin. And that is, is that to accommodate all the water that's being soaked up as you go from A to B, you need to actually have the hygroscopic groups, i.e. the phosphates, available or solvent accessible. 
And this conclusion um, led her to this particular simplistic model, which is we have a fiber here and the phosphates are on the outside and on the inside are the bases. And you might think, well, this is such a simple model. Why is it so profound? Well, it's so profound because she corrected two famously incorrect models. One of the models was by none other than the uh, Nobel laureate Linus Pauling, who published a structure here where the phosphates are on the inside. And what she concluded is that um, this would be unstable because first of all, you have phosphates which would require massive um, counter uh, cationic stabilization. And the other is, is that as you increase the humidity, this particular model would blow up. So she was able to convince both Pauling and Watson who came up with virtually identical models that this particular model was incorrect. So since Rosalind had one model which was clearly um, more uh, fiber and this had more order, she thought she might be able to get more structural information on the A-form. So she focused primarily her efforts on the A-form initially. She was able to determine the symmetry of the unit cell. Um, and from this, she was able to make density measurements, which she had been very accustomed to doing in her uh, work on carbon. And from this, given the unit cell parameters, she was able to deduce that there were two strands of DNA um, in the DNA fiber. She was also able to calculate for the first time a cylindrical Patterson function on a macromolecule. So this gives you um, uh, information about the structure, but it's actually giving you a difference map. So it's only looking at atom to atom difference vectors. So the interpretation of this is a little bit complicated, but it did provide important validation after uh, Watson and Crick's model was published. So what I'm gonna talk about now are some uh, quotes from papers which were submitted prior to Dr. Franklin's viewing of the Watson Crick model. So clearly she acknowledged that there were hydrogen bonds between the bases. She assumed that the uh, one molecule of DNA would uh, be stabilized and be able to form interactions with a second molecule of uh, DNA through a cationic um, uh, channel. And she also uh, had read and um, appreciated this important paper by Cochrane, Crick, and, and Vand, which defined the Bessel functions, which defined hel helical diffraction. And so she recognized that photo 51 was a helical structure. Um, the other thing that she did is she was a, uh, a great scientist because she always acknowledged previous work um, so she acknowledged this paper by Gulliand and Jordan, which showed that the hydrogen bonding groups, the carbonyl and nitrogen groups of bases were inaccessible in DNA, but the phosphate was accessible. And again, this goes back to her uh, verifying her initial uh, assumption that the phosphates are on the outside, the bases are on the inside. So now in order to understand photo 51, we need to understand a little bit about diffraction. So let's say we have, this is the period of a helix. So at a certain angle, um, the atoms at this particular position in the helix are going to be in phase with the scattering from this one. So you can see here, we have a peak here and at that, exactly the same place we have a peak here. So if there's one wavelength difference between this and this repeat, this is referred to as the first layer line. And so this cor would correspond to this peak here. If on the other hand, we um, rotate this up to an angle which is one and a half times that angle, we get completely destructive interference. So the maximum here lines up with the minimum here. And so this will give us absolutely no diffraction at this point. We can now go to uh, two wavelengths, which would be two theta here. And we get the second layer line and we can go to three wavelengths, which would be three theta, and that gives us the third layer line, et cetera. So now, why are we seeing the X pattern? 
And so in order to understand that, what I'm going to do is show you some um, optical uh, uh, simulations where you actually take a grating and you shine a laser light through an optical grating. And this mimics uh, projections in X-ray diffraction. So if you have a particular set of uh, slits, it's going to give you um, this pattern here. If we now have a uh, zig line in this direction here, you'll notice that the diffraction pattern, each uh, layer line actually goes off in this direction here. And this angle here is related to this angle here. If we now do the opposite or a, a zag, we get the uh, other side. So now if we combine zig and zag, we actually get the characteristic cross. Uh, and then if we have a continuous regular helix um, and, and not a zigzag, again, the cross feature is remains the same. So at this point, I wanna introduce some of the conclusions of uh, mathematics, uh, specifically the basal functions. And this allowed um, Dr. Franklin to determine that uh, the helix diameter was 20 angstroms and that there are 10 phosphates per, ch uh, per chain in one turn of the helix. And again, this was written before Dr. Franklin viewed the Watson-Crick model. So um, when we're looking at individual uh, spots, so all of the uh, simulations that I showed you were for continuous um, electrons in a helix. So in other words, not individual atoms. But we know that um, our helices are made of individual atoms. And for simplicity, we're going to um, focus in on phosphate. And the reason for this simple simplicity is that phosphates scatter much, much more than the other atoms found in DNA. So as a first approximation, we can look at the scattering of DNA as the scattering of phosphate atoms. And so as a simplistic example, we're going to have this simple helix, which has one, two, three, four, five phosphates for a repeat. And we have a rise uh, uh, defined here. And when we actually apply the Bessel function theory, what we see is this characteristic X pattern here. And then at the uh, meridian um, uh, line, which is actually defined as this line going up and down here, at the fifth layer line, uh, we're seeing um, uh, this particular uh, function here. And uh, this will give us one over the rise. And this distance here will give us one over the pitch. So for uh, reasons which are beyond the scope of this particular presentation, the diffraction pattern is referred to reciprocal space because the dimensions are reciprocal. This dimension here is one over the rise. This dimension here is one over the pitch. So now let's go back to photo 51. So we have our equator here, which I'll be referring to um, in future diffraction uh, slides, as well as the meridian, and we can count up one through 10. So as we see this strong meridian peak, we already know that there's gonna be 10 nucleotides per turn. Uh, so, and this will also give us the pitch. Uh, the spacing here gives us the pitch. And uh, the fact that we have this strong uh, meridial um, intensity here uh, tells us that there are 10 nucleotides per repeat. And this will also give us the rise. So again, from density measurements, she determined that there were most likely two uh, non-equivalent chains. But she also made an, another important observation that the two chains were related by three eighths of a period axis. So how in the world did she deduce this? Well, she deduced this by looking at something um, missing in photo 51. So let's look at a single helix here. So at a single helix, we're getting constructive interference at certain wavelengths, at certain angles. Now, if I put in a second helix here that's separated by three eighths of the period of the first helix, um, the difference between uh, this length and this length is this ratio here, three in lambda divided by eight. If we look at, and so at this particular angle here, again, the primary or the red helix is giving us constructive interference. 
if we take n as equal to four, um, what it means is, is that this scattering from the blue helix is going to be out of phase with the scattering from the red helix. Okay, so it's completely destructive interference at n equals four. And so that means that there will be a systematic absence at the fourth layer line. And lo and behold, there is a systematic absence at the fourth layer line. So Dr. Franklin's work um, determined what's on the inside and the outside. She determined that there were two strands and not only that, but they were translationally related by a specific amount. Um, she determined the symmetry. And one of the things that she is later um, reported as having said is that she did not fully appreciate the uh, dyad symmetry. So this is something that she has said, quote, I could have kicked myself for not recognizing this. And the reason why um, Dr. Crick recognized it is he had been working on the structure determination of hemoglobin, which had the same space group. So he was used to understanding and appreciating this particular information. And of course, she had all the parameters of the helix. So the tragic thing about this story is that um, due in part to Dr. Wilkins feeling uh, left out because his project was taken from him, um, uh, he shared information without Dr. Franklin's consent to Dr. Uh, Crick and Dr. Watson. Not only that, but uh, Max Perutz shared one of Dr. Franklin's MRC reports again without her consent to Dr. Crick and Dr. Watson. So a lot of the information that uh, uh, Watson and Crick used to develop their model came directly from Dr. Franklin. Um, so what uh, Dr. Crick recognized immediately is because the twofold axis of symmetry was perpendicular to the helix, what that meant is the two chains of the helix were in opposite directions. And what Crick further did is he took advantage of a structure by a Norwegian scientist who was visiting King's College and published this structure in uh, 1952, a year before their structure. And it shows something that's fairly similar to the structure in um, uh, B-form DNA. And just by applying the twofold axis of symmetry um, we, and bringing them together, we have something that's not too far away from the true structure of DNA. Now, once the structure of DNA was determined, it, it was still a model. It wasn't fully validated, even though the diffraction data did fit it. And it wasn't fully validated um, until uh, 1980. Um, when, Dr. Dickerson crystallized pure DNA dodecamer and solved its structure. But immediately after seeing the, uh, the structure of DNA, um, Dr. Franklin realized, well, I have this cylindrical Patterson function and I can actually use the structure of DNA and see if my cylindrical uh, um, Patterson function validates the model. And so what she was able to do is look at the intraphosphate vectors, and that's shown here for one strand. And then the other strand gives these following interphosphate um, vectors with the crosses here. And this agrees reasonably well with the cylindrical Patterson. So this provided the first concrete data that was in addition to the fiber diffraction data. Now, Dr. Franklin um, was uh, obviously unhappy at King's College because of the friction between her and Dr. Wilkins, as well as the friction between her and Dr. Watson. And so she sought out an, another appointment and she went to uh, Birkbeck College and she started working on viruses. So now I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about her accomplishments on TMV. So TMV is actually the, at the cornerstone of virology. It actually, the initial experiments, which occurred in 1898, 
um, actually laid the groundwork for the science of virology. And the naming comes from the mosaic pattern of spots on uh, tobacco leaves. So prior to Dr. Franklin's um, uh, joining the field, there were several important discoveries. So one was is that the uh, proteins that made up uh, the virus coat uh, formed a helix. And they, they, there was a repeat of about 69 angstroms. And so there were a number of subunits that repeated three times until you got to the next um, uh, three helical turns. This is a very large molecule. It's uh, 150 angstroms wide and 3,000 angstroms long. And this work was uh, initiated by uh, Bernal and uh, Fonk Kuchin. Um, and Bernal is actually her uh, department uh, leader at Birkbeck College. And Watson actually did some uh, important initial work on this as well. So you can see that uh, Dr. Franklin never got away from Watson uh, in, in, throughout her career. And the other thing that was assumed is all spherical viruses had nucleic acids on the inside. So because the, the helix is made of proteins, the thought was the core was, was full of nucleic acids. So that was the working hypothesis. So this is the type of diffraction that uh, uh, Dr. Watson got on TMV, and no surprise, uh, Dr. Franklin got amazingly higher quality and better diffraction because she knew what um, equipment to use and how to actually uh, treat the samples in a way that produced the best quality uh, diffraction. So the importance of uh, Dr. Franklin is not just that she could produce unbelievably high quality diffraction images, but she also knew how to interpret them. So in this particular um, image here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in on this low resolution diffraction here. And what we can see is here are the layer lines and you can see that uh, along the uh, meridian here, we're seeing spots every three. So this is indicating that there is uh, uh, three turns before you have a repeat. Um, but there are definitely more than uh, three protein subunits in this uh, repeat. And that's because there's not a maximum at the meridian. So you can see here, there's a minimum here. This is a trace that I traced um, uh, based on some data that I found in Rosalind Franklin's archives. And so from this, we have, uh, this verifies what Dr. Uh, Watson had determined. So there are uh, every three turns uh, of, the, of the protein subunits, uh, we have a repeat, and that this repeat is uh, made of 3n plus 1 subunits. So Dr. Watson had not so great diffraction, and so what he thought he saw was at the meridian that there was a peak um, at layer line 31, and you can see in this uh, much better diffraction spot that at, at layer line 31, it's split and there's actually no intensity at the meridian. And so Dr. Franklin correctly deduced that N is got to be much greater than 10. The other thing that she noticed is that there was various pieces of data that suggested that the virus had grooves in it. Uh, and so the first piece of data, and I'm not going to show you the data, so she did a cylindrical Patterson because she knew how to do that. And the cylindrical Patterson indicated that the edge of the virus was not smooth, but actually had features that uh, looked like a groove. She then turned to analysis of the Bessel functions and also the intens intensities along the third layer line. And based on this intensity distribution, she was able to determine that there had to be grooves, or at least it was consistent with grooves. So these two pieces of data allowed her to establish that there were grooves on the uh, TMV virus. The other thing that she did is she looked at wet data. So all of the diffraction I've showed you thus far is of wet particles. She also looked at dried particles. And it was known from EM data that the dry particles had hexagonal symmetry, but nobody understood why. Well, it turns out that um, 
If you have grooves, it can allow the two grooves to interlock. Uh, and by interlocking, they can actually form this hexagonal packing, close packing arrangement. And so this is actually the structure of the dry TMD. So now uh, Dr. Franklin was inspired by work of Perutz who established something called the isomorphous uh, method to get at the phase problem. And so um, Dr. Franklin used all of her uh, uh, collaborations to uh, collect three important samples. So she had a TMV, which was protein only. And previous work had shown that the overall structure is extremely similar to the um, holo virus. And she also had a virus where the single cysteine in the subunit was modified with methyl mercury. So this was the holo virus, so protein plus RNA, but every single subunit protein has a single mercury. And by using collecting data on all three of these, um, she was able to get the first views uh, of this particular virus at higher resolution. So one of the things she realized is, is that because the proteins are related by symmetry and because the uh, cysteine sits at the same place in all of these proteins, that therefore means that the distance between the axis, the symmetry axis, of the helix and the mercury is gonna be identical for all of the mercuries in the entire particle. And she was able to use this to start uh, calculating some uh, vessel functions and she could actually uh, compare observed data with calculated data to actually um, estimate what the uh, length of this particular vector was. And so uh, she was able to calculate for the mercury a vessel function that at these, this particular uh, point in the diffraction angle, so this is our uh, direct beam and this is going out from the beam. At these particular points, there should be nodes in the diffraction pattern. And when she calculated using this particular vector length for uh, the mercury position, She's clearly seeing a wave coming out where there should be a node. So this is clearly incorrect. For a much larger distance, she again, where there should be a node, she's seeing a wave pattern. So that's clearly incorrect. And for uh, 57, she sees that at all these positions, there's a node and this is crossing zero. There's a node, it's crossing zero. A node, it's crossing zero. A node, it's crossing zero. So this is the, uh, close to the correct distance. She was then able to compare the intensities of the mercury with the intensities without mercury and get a difference map and actually uh, calculate the vessel function depending on how many subunits you would have uh, per turn. So she calculated for 46, for 49, and for 52. What we see in red here is the difference map so this is the difference peak. And there's only one vessel function that completely encompasses this data. And that is for subunit 49. Now, everything I've gone through in the last slide or two is entirely highly technical. And so I wanted to give you a much simpler way to validate that there are 49 subunits per repeat. So given the fact that we have this hypothesis of 49 and we know the length of the particle, we can figure out the number of subunits per particle. And from this, we, we also know that the molecular weight, so this should be 10 to the six, not 106. Um, so it, the, the molecular weight had been determined independently. And so this gives us a um, number for the number, the molecular weight of the subunit. And these subunits had been independently determined between 17 and 18 kilodaltons, which matches beautifully this calculation. And we now actually know what the true molecular weight is. And again, it's extremely close to this calculation. All the previous subunit calculations uh, had shown numbers which were much, much higher than 17,000. So this is an independent validation of the 49 uh, subunits. So the next uh, thing that she did, and this is probably the most important contribution that Dr. 
um, Franklin made to TMV viruses is to utilize the information about the location of the uh, mercury atoms to determine structure factors uh, for reflections on the equatorial line and thereby calculate a radial density. And you'll see in a second why this matters so much. And so what she's doing is she's comparing data from protein only TMV and the protein plus um, RNA. And so here, what you see is a radial distribution. And so this is work um, by Franklin. Uh, and what you can see here is that the center core of the virus, so this is the center of the helix and then it's going out in angstrom. So it looks, it's, it's going out a little bit past 80 angstroms. So the center core is hollow. And this is something that um, people thought originally that it was hollow and that it was filled with nucleic acid. But at the same time, uh, Don Casper was getting his PhD at Yale, and he was doing a similar technique um, to what Rosalind Franklin was doing, um, but he had the holoenzyme. And so you can see the match is pretty good, and the main difference is that we have this huge peak here. So the expectation was the nucleic acid would be here, but in actual fact, the nucleic acid is here. And just a little side note, Don Casper was not the most proficient writer. And I think Dr. Franklin was a little impatient. And so she actually ended up writing this paper for uh, Dr. Casper. And in the paper, she never acknowledged that she wrote the paper. So Dr. Franklin then continued on this. So th the reason why the fit here is much better is, is that uh, Dr. Casper and Franklin were using slightly different methods. Here, when we're doing the comparison of uh, TMV, no RNA versus TMV, um, it's done with the exact same method. And so you can see that the, the, the match is very, very strikingly good, except for this big peak here, which occurs at about 40 angstroms. And what we're looking at here are different uh, strains of the virus. Uh, so this is uh, different evolutionarily related viruses, and they all have the nucleic acid at 40 angstrom. So this is a conserved feature of the virus. So now we can actually look at how this all fits together. And so these are the individual uh, subunits of the virus. We have our hollow core, which again, everyone assumed that there were nucleic acids sitting in here, but the nucleic acid is not sitting in there. The nucleic acid is sitting at, at uh, 40 angstroms away. And uh, various pieces of data led Dr. Franklin to determine that this was single-stranded RNA. One of the things that, that she utilized to do this is, is that, um, in order to fit in this particular thing, um, she, she was assuming that the RNA itself was also helical because if we looked at the fiber diffraction pattern, there's absolutely no indication that this N equals three is violated along the meridian. So we always see spacing zero, three, six, nine. The other thing is, is that if we assume um, that the RNA is spread throughout the virus, it comes out to about three nucleotides per turn. And if we now um, uh, use that three nucleotides per turn, we come up with a molecular weight for the RNA, which matches an independently determined molecular weight. The other thing that this uh, answered is when you had a protein only virus, the virus particles were of different lengths. Whereas if you had the holovirus RNA plus protein, the virus was a fixed length. And so what Dr. Franklin surmised is that the um, RNA is actually working with the protein and defining the length. So once you actually run out of RNA, you stop assembling the protein component. So this is just showing you the buildup of each subunit, building up, building up, all the way around, and there are 13, 16 and a third subunits going around in this direction. The RNA is sitting at 40 angstroms, and again, there's this hole in, in the middle. And uh, what we see here is 
this structure determination was a big deal and it was a big deal because it was actually uh, shown at the first in major international event that took place after World War II. So this was Expo uh, 58. This was the World's Fair in Brussels. And uh, this structure was considered such a big deal that um, uh, Rosalind Franklin and her team were invited to present this, uh, I think it was five foot five model of TMV and you can see into the inside so you can see the hollow core and this rod here is actually representing the RNA whereas this is the subunits. So uh, one of the things uh, about Dr. Franklin is not only her significant contributions to science, but one of the things that actually defines a truly great scientist is not just their contributions, but also their ability to train and attract star future scientists. And Rosalind Franklin had this in spades. So one of her uh, postdoctoral fellows was Aaron Klug, who won the Nobel Prize uh, and was also a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, she also worked and trained uh, Kenneth Holmes, who also is a member of the Royal Society and won some prestigious awards. And she worked with Don Casper, um, who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So any scientist would be um, gobsmacked to have trained such a unbelievable group of students. And this was basically one cadre of, of her students. And in a very short time publishing, she published nine nature papers. Many of them are Rosalind Franklin alone as sole author. So unfortunately, I did not have time to talk about her uh, many contributions to understanding of carbon compounds, which led to making better gas masks during World War II, and also led to making appropriate graphite for cooling nuclear reactors. If you're interested in learning more about this, this is a great review article. Um, Dr. Aaron Klug um, wrote a phenomenal review of uh, Dr. Franklin's contributions uh, to the st structure determination of DNA. And then Krager and Morgan wrote a great review about Dr. Franklin's contributions to TMV. And um, before I take questions and comments, I would just like to read a quote from a Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Stanley, who uh, upon uh, Franklin's death wrote the following. Dr. Franklin's life is an example of complete devotion to scientific research. She was a woman of great intelligence and wide culture and her main interest was devoted to discovering the ever more complex and significant patterns underlying the process of nature. In addition to this, she was a essentially an international courier of goodwill and scientific information. I think that one of her most outstanding characteristics was her courage. It is now known that she was quite aware of the fatal nature of her last illness. Those of us who were fairly close to her knew little of this. She never spoke about it, but she continued right on to the last to work and plan as though her life were to continue. And as I said, I'm only briefly touching upon Dr. Franklin's uh, phenomenal contributions. And at this point, I would be happy to entertain questions or comments. Thank you, Dr. Carell. Uh, one of our um, questions that we had come in was, uh, are you familiar with Dr. Matthew Cobb's recent lecture on Rosalind Franklin via Genetic Engineering News? He suggested that Franklin's departure from King's was driven more by her interest in viruses and career aspirations than her relationship with Wilkins. What are your thoughts? Um, well, so that is commented um, in uh, uh, Dr. Maddox's book. Um, so, I th so obviously we will never know because we cannot ask Dr. Franklin, um, but I think that for a long time, I mean, almost from the very beginning, she was not really happy at King's College. And I think 
there was some friction that was there from the very beginning. And so she was actively searching for a position. Um, I think after her first year, she started looking. Um, but what was her ultimate motivation, whether it was that she was really excited about pursuing virus research, uh, the, the department that she went in was headed by Dr. Burnell, who uh, did some of the pioneering work on TMB. And so when she was looking for positions, maybe she saw his work and was very excited by it. Um, it's, it's hard to know. Another question uh, that has come in is, uh, with your vast experience in X-ray clusterography, did you have any interactions at Yale at the end of the 20th century with this year's Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Jennifer uh, Dudna? The mechanism of CRSPR was aided greatly by X-ray crystal, crystallographic structures of the pro protein uh, AND NRA, similar to your description of Dr. Franklin and TMB virus. Um, yes, indeed. Um, uh, when uh, Dr. Um, Doudna was first beginning her studies in crystallography. She was working on a piece of catalytic RNA and uh, she needed help freezing those crystals. And so she came to Yale um, before she actually joined the faculty. This was when she was a postdoc. She came to Yale uh, to figure out how to not only freeze crystals, but collect data on those frozen crystals. And I was there to help her do that. So I got to know uh, Dr. Dalna fairly well before she joined the faculty at Yale. And then I, as a postdoc, um, interacted with her um, for a few years before I uh, left Yale as a postdoc. And she was a fabulous person to work with. She's an unbelievably creative and imaginative scientist. And uh, she and her colleague definitely deserve that Nobel Prize. Thank you. Are there any more uh, questions for the Q&A portion of the presentation? Uh, if there are, please go ahead and use the uh, Q&A option um, here in Zoom. And I think that we don't have any more questions at this time. Dr. Carell, uh, would you like to have some closing comments? Um, yeah, so the one thing that I was really amazed by when I did this work is, is that I had some vague impressions about what Dr. Franklin did and what her contributions were. And after reading many of her papers, I, did, I have to admit I did not read all 48 of her papers, but I read quite a few of her papers and I was totally blown away by her gift for writing. She was an unbelievably gifted writer and uh, her contributions, given the fact that she was only a published author for 13 years, really just blew me away. I, I, was, I left this project with so much more appreciation for her contributions to science and her as a, as a human being. And a lot of the um, animosity about her personality and stuff. So when she was working in Paris, she got along with everybody. And when she was working at Birkbeck, she got along with everybody. And she was able to um, bridge collaborations with uh, warring virologists on various sides of the Atlantic. So I think there was just a, a, a very unfortunate personality conflict between her and Dr. Wilkins and also Dr. Watson. But other than that, she seemed to be quite amiable and got along extremely well with all the other colleagues that she interacted with. Uh, this comment from, uh, from Dr. Elliott, a uh, great presentation, Dr. Corral. You should publish this review since few historians of science have the X-ray crystallographic experience to fully understand RF's insights. Thank you. That concludes our uh, presentation for today. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Corral and, and all the attendees uh, that have joined us for this presentation. Thank you.